Welcome to the GovComs podcast, bringing you the latest insights and innovations from experts and thought leaders around the globe in government communication. Now, here is your host, David Pembroke. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to GovComs, the podcast that examines the practice of content communication in government and the public sector. My name's David Pembroke. Today, one of my favorite topics, and you know this, it's about measurement and evaluation. How, in fact, do we as communicators put programs together, implement those programs, and then prove that, in fact, we are either making progress or we are achieving the objectives that we set out or indeed to the goals that we're setting ourselves so as that we are measuring indeed the goals that we're seeking to achieve as well. We are going to talk today to Stacey Barr, who's the creator of the PUMP methodology for measuring organisational performance and developing meaningful KPIs. Stacey is one of the world's leaders in performance measurement. She's the author of two books, Practical Performance Measurement and Prove it. She writes a weekly blog called Measure Up or on her weekly blog called Measure Up, but her content also appears on the Harvard Business Review's website and also in their acclaimed Manage Mentor program. Stacey has been in this business for a long time, way back in 1993 is when she got started. And really, this gave gave her an insight into the transformational power of measuring the right things and doing that well. The most common obstacles that she observes are immeasurable goals, meaningless measures, lack of buy-in, and KPI dashboards that are useless. The root cause, she found, is that common KPI practice is fraught with bad habits. So she decided to solve the problem and developed her own methodology. Pump is known for its practicality in making performance measurement faster, easier, engaging, and meaningful. And who doesn't want those things? Strategy and performance professionals say it made it easier to engage with people and align their work to the strategy. She joins me on the line now. Stacey, thanks very much for joining us on GovComs. It's an absolute pleasure, David. Thank you for having me. Yeah, well, look, I I am so obsessed with this at the moment because I think this is the, this is the muscle that we need to develop in comms teams working in government and public sector around the world because we have to prove our value. One of the big issues for comms peoples, as we've often called on on this program, we're seen as the end of the line function, the colouring in department who just makes things look pretty but doesn't really add value. So as we march up the value curve, we really need to to lift our game. And there are a number of uh, frameworks around the world, the AMEC framework that I know the UK government has certainly integrated into their work and it does have widespread applicability. But I'm really fascinated by the pump methodology because it's 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 different um, in the way that it goes about it. So perhaps how about we start by just the the basics of of the pump methodology and why it is different. Good place to start, David. It's it's different because it's thorough. It's different because it covers all of the steps that it takes to think properly about what do we want to measure, how we measure it, how do we bring those measures to life and how do we use them to inform our decisions. So it's, it's really thorough in that end-to-end way. And it's, it's fairly practical too. Uh, you mentioned in your very kind introduction for me that uh, there are a bunch of struggles that people have with KPIs and measuring. And it, it doesn't matter who I speak to, whether what country they're in, what their first language is, what industry or sector they work in, these struggles are the same everywhere. And if we're going to make measuring more meaningful, make it easier, make it faster, and, and make it lead to the impacts that we're trying to have through our actions, then we can't live with those struggles. So PUMP is specifically designed, each step in it, to tackle those struggles. Okay, so let's let's go through this, and I, I do want to sort of really step through this so as that people can understand and perhaps take some notes as they go. So if they are applying the pump methodology, how do we get started? And perhaps even let's maybe make up a little bit of a case study. Say we're, we're trying to implement a whole of government uh, business transformation in the ICT, say, shared services area. Um, how might we start to think about that using the pump methodology? Very first thing is to decide who's going to work on this because 
what often happens or a mistake that happens with measuring is that we try to outsource it or just get one person to do it for us. Uh, Pump is a team-based method because it's through teams who work in those processes like ICT or um, or, or whatever part of the organisation, it's it's those people that know what's going on and understand the work. They have to be involved. So the first step is to form a team. Uh, we just call that the measures team. It doesn't have to be called that, uh, but we'll refer to it as the measures team. Okay. Uh, and so, for example, so so who might yeah. be on on the measures team? So I'm oh. I, if I'm, for example, the, the the comms lead on this particular project, where where might I find people, or where do I have to get people to to make sure that my measurement is is going to be comprehensive? Excellent question. So you would be on the team. Thank you. <laughs> um, and uh, other types of people to include is probably two or three people who work in the comms process, who understand uh, collectively between the, the two or three of them how the whole process works. You'll also want uh, someone in the team that has an understanding of that has a data mind, you know, they're, they're comfortable with numbers. They might even know what data is collected in, in the comms processes. They might know who else in the organisation to talk to about getting data. Uh, and you'd need someone who has at least one person who has, has been trained in pump because pump does not come naturally. We're not born with it. In hindsight, it looks incredibly logical and simple, but that's not the way we feel like when we're we're just starting out with it. So that would be the, the complement of your team. And I would say six or seven people is more than enough. You don't want to go beyond that or you'll end up bogging down with spinning your wheels and having conversations that go around in circles. It's not necessarily. We find six or, or seven people is ideal for our measures team. Okay, and so we've gathered um, together, uh, respecting social distancing in these new worlds. Um, so <laughs> we then start the conversation. How does the conversation start? I will answer you, but I love what you said about uh, the social distancing. We actually have quite a few people around the world who are geographically spread out very wide, and they can't have their measures teams all in the measures team members all in the same room. So you know there are virtual ways to to run. Uh, measures team conversations. The first conversation they'll have, coming back to your question, David, is about what measurement's really about, what its real purpose is, because we often have very different ideas. Some people feel like measurement's a big stick to hit them over the head with. Other people feel like it's a tool for judging whether they succeeded or failed. Others think it's got something to do with what gets written in performance appraisals. Uh, So people have very different ideas about what it is. Step one is let's get on the same page. In Pump, measurement's purpose is for the continuous improvement of business processes. It's not for judging people. It's not for measuring people. It's tools in people's hands so they can get a better understanding of the results they collaborate to produce through their work processes and uh, and to use those measures to inform them as a team how to make better decisions to improve those processes and therefore get better results. So that's the first conversation. Mm-hmm. So we've had that conversation. What do we do next? So we're, we're agreed that this is all about continuous improvement. Where are the places that we've got to go to start looking um, for the key measurement framework for your particular project? Because, again, this is a, applicable really across any sort of project or program, isn't it? It is across anything. The, the first step is a very generic step and it has to be generic because I think if we look too uh, hard for existing measure frameworks or what everybody else is measuring, we've actually thrown ourselves off track. The first question we really need to answer before we even think of measures is what results are we trying to achieve? Now, very often teams will have a set of goals maybe or objectives that, uh, that, that they are trying to achieve to, to reach. And, and those goals or objectives are not usually the business as usual stuff. It's not the stuff they already do routinely and do quite well that doesn't need improvement. It's the stuff that does need improvement. Very often, the whole organization or whole company's uh, strategy will set the context for that. Uh, so if the, if the company's strategic direction is about uh, completely shifting the way the market understands the value they provide, then the comms team is going to have different kinds of goals uh, that, w- that will relate to that. So it starts with the goals and, and, and that's really got to be laid out in front of the measures team when they're sitting there. These are the goals that we're trying to get measures for so that we can achieve the goals. Mm-hmm. So if we look at those goals, do we then, th- when do we start thinking about the people? Because indeed to achieve those goals, we have to have people doing things. So 
how, do, how are we then going to start to think about and how are those conversations going to take place such that we can um, influence people in such a way that we will achieve those goals, but in fact, we'll also be able to measure their, their reaction, their behaviour, whatever it is, such that we're on, on, on a path towards that continuous improvement, which is going to get us to those goals. One of the, the struggles that people commonly have with measurement is that tension between measures and people. And one of the bad habits that sits behind that struggle is that we think too quickly about how we're going to achieve a goal. What we've got to do, and this is what Pump helps us do, is it separates our thinking into firstly, really, what is this goal about? What is the result we're trying to achieve? How do we get evidence of that and measure it? And then a whole bunch of steps happen to implement the measure. And once we've got the baseline for the measure, I think in a previous podcast, I've heard you refer to that as a benchmark, Mm. David, like where are we starting from? Mm. Where's our current level of performance? It's only then that we start understanding how much better do we want to be and therefore what kinds of actions are going to help us achieve that and then who should be involved. So the answer to your question is we don't start thinking about who's going to be involved and how they're going to be involved and what actions they're going to take until the very end of pump. Hmm. Okay. That's interesting. But it's different. Hey, you know, like it's it's not what people expect. No, no, exactly. But so, so then perhaps if you might just give me an example of, of that conversation, what, what might that look like in, in that particular part of, of the pump methodology? The, the conversation around what the goals mean or the conversation yeah. around, yeah, well. No, yeah, the, yeah, understanding what the goals mean before we start thinking of anything further down the track. What we want to do fundamentally is make a goal measurable. Now, sometimes we look at a goal and we think, oh, yeah, let's just brainstorm some measures for that. And then we find out through the brainstorming that people don't really get what the goal's about. Goals have problems with the way they're written. They can be written as actions rather than results. Goals are about states we're trying to get to that we can't not aren't currently at. They're not about projects that we're trying to finish. The project is the action or the how that we achieve a goal. The goal is the end state that that project or action will get us to. So we've got to make sure first that we've written a goal that's results oriented. It describes what we're trying to change or improve or the impact we're going to have. Another problem goals have is that they're written weaselly. Are you familiar with that term, weasel words, David? <laughs> yes, I am. Yes. Indeed. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, I learned it from um, from uh, uh, Don Watson. Have I got his oh, name yeah. right? I've no, just no, got yeah, a mental. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Former, Ke- former, yeah, Ke- uh, the Keating's- former Prime Minister of Australia's speechwriter, Don Watson. Correct. Mm. I learned that term from him, and it's you know goals are written with weasel words: yeah. effective, efficient, sustainable, productive, leveraged. You know all of those kinds of words that sound professional and they sound very businesslike and they sound really succinct. And nobody understands what they mean. Mm. And everybody's too scared to ask whoever created the goal what they mean. So we've really got to smash the weasel words. We've got to put it put goals into plain language. And I, I like to give the the tip that if you could read your goal to a ten year old and they understand it or could at least ask an intelligent question to get that understanding, then your goal's probably pitched at the right level. It's not dumbed down. It's clarified. Mm-hmm. But in terms of, of having goals as well, how many you know, do you think is, is reasonable that you should be focused on? Is it, is it three, the magic, the magic number three? It's not a bad guideline, um, David. I, I, I would say that um, one to three goals to start out, like, like if you're going to take on something like pump, you're doing something that's quite different to what we're used to. There's a learning curve with that. There's also an unlearning – is there an unlearning curve? Yeah. For example, weasel words are hard to get out of our language, so we have to unlearn the tendency to use them. So because of the new learning and the unlearning, uh, sticking to one to three goals is – ample. It's more than enough. And you know what? It it doesn't mean that we're doing less. We're actually going to end up with a far higher chance of achieving those goals. And therefore, we're going to have a much bigger impact by keeping our, our focus narrow. In the future, once people master this different approach to measuring and, and pursuing goals, you could probably end up with five, six or seven that you could focus on. But in the early da- days of trying a better approach to doing it, one to three is spot on. Okay. So if... Going back to our, our example around a business transformation, whole of government, ICT platform, what might be a, an example of a well-written goal? How about we start with one that, because I'm not too familiar with the, with the sort of comms area and 
off the top of my head, can't think of any specific goals I might have. Um, can we talk about what something might be? And we don't have to make it measurable straight away. If we no, start no, off with no. something weaselly, we can play with it. Yeah, good. Okay. Yep. Okay. Well, let's say that we are hoping to, you know, well, well the end state is, you know, a, a, an efficient and effective whole of government uh, ICT digital platform that all agencies are using in order to deliver savings, which can then help, obviously, uh, you know, be spent on other things by the government, such as frontline services. So it's a, it's about that efficiency, we, well, which is I'm not quite sure that this could, an entirely <laughs> weaselly word, but it's all about how, how, do, how do we become more efficient and effective in the way that we operate our ICT infrastructure so we're taking advantage of technological innovation and we're deriving the dividend from, you know, the adoption of, of greater digital technologies and uh, standardised processes such that we can spend less money on, on ICT. Lovely. That, that was brilliant, David. Three weasel words pop out straight away. Efficient is a weasel word and so is effective. And the other word that you – oh, I've, I missed it. It started with D. Anyway, we'll come back to it. Um, dividend. 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 Yes, that was the word. Uh, so we need a conversation about what that means. So if we're going to be more efficient in the way we use ICT infrastructure, what does that mean to you? How could you describe that to a 10-year-old? Uh, more efficient to a 10-year-old. Um Specifically in the context of the ICT, using ICT infrastructure, not a definition of the word efficient. That's not going to help us. It has to be what, why, why did you pick that word for uh, this, this use of ICT infrastructure? What, what's, what's efficient use of ICT infrastructure? What's inefficient use? You know, we've got to play with it and unpack it. Okay. So it's, it's really then these definitional points because I suppose to me it's about – Efficiency, explaining that to a uh, a ten year old, is a reduction in numbers of systems being used to achieve a particular outcome. It's a better skilled workforce that are using uh, processes that are standardised, such that we don't have duplication. Uh, so it's that that conversation is that the sort of thing that you're talking about. Spot on. So what I pick out of what you've just said there is that efficient to us right now in this moment means that we want uh, less systems, possibly even less steps in the comms process, yeah. less time being spent on it, in particular, less rework or, or uh, duplication of effort. So straight away, you've unpacked efficiency. We've now got tangible things we can grab onto. And I, I don't know if you can you can already get a sense of this, but if we asked how would we measure efficiency, people would be stumped. They wouldn't know how to answer that. But if we say, how would you measure uh, duplication of effort? Now, now they're starting to think, well, yeah. um, how many times do we have to redo stuff? How many times am I doing something that somebody else has already done? And immediately it's in the physical world. And when it's in the physical world, it's countable. It's measurable. Got it. Okay. So, for example, we may be, you know, removing the number of steps. Yep. So a goal might be is to reduce the numbers of steps in a particular process by, you know, 5%, 10%, whatever that may be. Is that, is that what, where we're going with that then? That totally is. You don't even need the 5%. You don't even need to think about numbers yet. You just say we need th there to be okay. less steps in this process. We need there to be uh, less duplication of effort. And those kinds of things are, are all we need at this point. Because really, where we are right now, David, you and I are sitting in step two of pump and there are eight steps in pump. Okay. So we will move to the next step and that's when we'll start thinking about, well, how would we quantify that? What are potential measures for that? Okay, so how does that conversation sound? So once we've, we've now decided that that's exactly what we're going to do, we've defined what efficiency is, as yeah. you say, in the physical world, these are the actual things that we want to, to change, you know, to have less of or change. So yep. what are we, what's the conversation now as part of our measures team? Well, let's um, let's stick with the part about uh, maybe duplication of effort. Mm -hmm. So what we do to design a measure is that, well, we want quantitative measures and we want evidence-based measures. So the clue there is we've got to figure out what is the evidence that there's less mm -hmm. rework or duplication and 
once we know what the evidence is, then the question is, how do we quantify that? So we've got to break that down into two steps. We don't just jump straight into how do you measure duplication of effort. So the first step is, let's describe as a team, remember we're in a measures team, let's describe as a team, what would we see or touch or hear, or what would be the things we could observe in the real world that would tell us whether there was less duplication of effort or not. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I've got that. So that's the conversation. That, so we start to then think about, well, it might be, it, but again, it's action-based. Is that what you're talking about? It's, 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 it's observable-based. Based. Observable. It's not so much action-based. It's okay. not, not always action because one of the things that we might see in the physical world if there was less uh, duplication of effort is that we would see less of two things that were identical, two yeah, documents right. that were identical, two press releases that were pretty much identical, two whatevers. So they're not actions. They're things that we're actually observing. Okay, so that's a good point, I think, that it's it's really about uh, ob observation to the point of then, as you say, you're then talking about different things that you can then look at and understand what the the current state looks like and what the future, what you would like to get to in terms of a future state. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So then when you say then it's then the quantifying is then that's the yeah. attachment of the of the quantum. Yeah, that's, that's it. That's when we put numbers to this thing. So I know this is keeping it super, super simple and it might not be the way a real comms team would go with this. But if one of the things we listed as, a, as you know, sensory evidence that our, we'd have less duplication is that we, we just look at all of the, uh, the, the, the content we've generated and we might quantify duplication by saying what percentage of this content is uh, is is a copy of another piece of content, or or pretty close to a copy of another piece of content, like mm. like the two press releases that say pretty much the same thing. Mm -hmm. That would probably count as well. There's one piece of duplication, and over that set of content, what percentage of it has duplication in it? Mm -hmm. Okay, so then once we've got that in place, where where do we go now? Where we go next is. Not where a lot of people think they go because where they think they go next often is, oh, let's get the data and start reporting this. But that's jumping ahead too soon. One of the big struggles that we have with measurement is is people's fear of it and misunderstanding of it, as, as we, we talked about earlier, David. And that's why step one of PUMP is about getting the measures team on the same page and having that same understanding. Well, now we need to ex extend that or expand that understanding to all the other people that are going to have some kind of stake in what we're measuring. Uh, and that will be other people who work in the comms process. It could be uh, other people in the organisation that will collaborate with us, uh, our, our our internal partners. It, it could be the media, who knows. Mm. But we need to identify who those critical people are that have a stake in the measure and or the measures that we're developing. And we need to invite them in. Um, we do that in Pump using a really organic social process called a measures gallery so the team will just post their thinking about the you know how they reworded their goals to make them clear and measurable and how they designed their measures and the thinking that they did and they'll just invite these people to come in grab a cup of tea or coffee walk around give some feedback ask questions and just do a sanity check you know are we on the right track here does this look like it'll be useful information for you um if, if we bring this stuff to life so it's about building buy-in mm, okay and do those people then have the opportunity? Obviously, they have an opportunity to um, have input. But what sort of inputs are? What sort of feedback are you are you looking for? Are you looking for, I don't know, um, uh, you know, feedback on on the the, the quantum or feedback yep. on what? Well, basically, feedback on everything that you put in place. Is that, that anything and everything? The yeah, because one of the 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 oh, the spirit, the philosophies, the principles, the spirit behind a measure gallery is anything goes. Okay. We are inviting you to come in and respond in whatever way is natural for you to respond to. If you've got a suggestion for a different measure, put that into our list, please. We'd like to consider it. If you think that a measure that we've selected is going to be too hard to implement because of data problems, let us know that. If you think we've got the wrong goal here or we haven't really made the goal understandable enough to you, let us know. Mm -hmm. if, if you've got a suggestion for where we could get data from this measure we would love to have but don't think we can, please tell us where to get the data so it's anything. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so once that feedback has been incorporated, where, where to next? The measures team will then take that feedback, like you say, incorporate it. In other words, they may change the wording of their goals a little bit to make them even more clear. They may change some of the measures that they've chosen. 
and they will take those measures now into the next stage of implementation. So they flesh out uh, implementation plans, uh-huh. action plans to bring each measure to life, and that means a clear formula that identifying the data they need in, in more detail, where that data will come from, who will be uh, the person who's going to help get that data, uh, how, the, how the data or the measure values are going to be displayed because, as you'd well know in comms, depending on the question we're asking, the mm-hmm. format of the information might need to take different forms And the same with measures. When we're trying to answer a particular type of question, the measure has to be displayed in a particular type of graph to answer that question. Mm -hmm. So we think through all that detail Mm -hmm. and and then go ahead and get the data and start calculating the values of our measures ready for the next step. Mm -hmm. And that is? So once we've got that in place, what's next? The next step is to put these measure values into the appropriate kinds of charts so that we can answer the questions we have. Now, generally, the question that we have of any performance measure is... Is it going up, is it going down, or is it staying the same? <laughs> okay. Because that's that's what a performance measure is about. Uh, a performance measure is helping us understand that. Now, sure, we have other measures that help us understand well, where is it happening, why is it happening, uh, what, are the, what other things are correlated with it happening. They're different questions. Mm-hmm. They come in a little later in Pump. The primary question we're answering now is, is, is performance getting better, worse, or staying the same? Is it going up, down, or staying the same? And the best chart for that, is what we, we uh, have found is the XMR chart. It's a chart that has come from, I don't know if you remember back in the last century, David, the quality movement and oh, yeah. um, De- quality De- control. Deming? Deming? Was that his name? Deming. Deming. 3M. Edwards Deming, yes. Was it 3M? And he rebuilt J- Japan in uh, yeah, post-Second World War. Exactly, yeah. yeah. There you go. But loads and loads of, of companies use that kind of thinking and we're, we're just pulling one tiny little piece out of it that is so appropriate for performance measures and that's the XMR chart. Now, what it shows us is the measure tracking over time, but it also shows us where the average level of performance really is. It's not what the measure is doing this month. It's, it's something else. It's something a little, bit, a little bit longer term that takes into, the context, takes into context the uh, – natural variability that any measure will have. So it tells us where the current level of performance is, which obviously makes it easier to compare to targets then if we're going to set a target. But it also tell us, tells us how variable is this measure? How much does it fluctuate up and down? And it's it's therefore just the perfect way to answer that question. Is performance going up? Is it going down? And even how far away from target are we? Mm. But the issue really, isn't it, is that, you know, the discussion around performance measures is really about the underlying um, activity and trying to find this continuous improvement because it's, okay, it's going up. Okay, that's great. It's going up. Why is it going up? Why is that important? Why did it go up? Um, What's the emerging context that we've got to deal with? How how may this be impacted? So it's really those performance conversations, isn't it, that comes from a set of measures that is the, the critically important part. But it's that evidence-based, fact-based that is really going to help you to have uh, valuable um, conversations. You, you've intuitively described the next step in PUMP. So right. after we've got those charts, is it's how do we put them together in reports where we can have that kind of conversation you just described. And even in the way you described it, David, you very cleverly pilled, pilled, out, pulled out the uh, the three main questions that we, we need a performance report or dashboard to answer for us, and that is what is performance currently doing? That's the XMR chart. Why is it doing that? Mm. What's the cause of this thing that we're seeing? Why isn't it going up when we want it to? Uh, and that's where we dig down and, and figure out what what's what's in our comms process design that's not quite working right, that's causing this measure not to be any better. And that that's just coming back to the who's in the measures team that's why we need people who understand the comms process in our measures team about reaching comms goals. Mm. Uh, and the third question is, so what do we do now? Mm. Once we've understood the causes, what is, how do we design the right kind of action to address those causes and to close the performance gap, to move uh, our measure from where it is now, the, the baseline or the current level of performance, up to where or down to where the target is? Mm-hmm. So... Is that the end of the process and sort of rinse and repeat and, and, and continue to track, continue to get the data uh, to understand where it is or is there there's more? It can feel like this is the natural end point, but it's actually not quite. Um, there's a step eight in Pump where we 
monitor the improvements that we've chosen. Okay. Yeah, if this yeah. makes sense, yeah, yeah, through the yeah. lens of our measure. Because right. very often, strategic initiatives, change initiatives, improvement projects, they all get set. It's like a set it and forget it kind of mentality. Yeah, right. we've, we've allocated our budget. We've set the project. We've got a team. Off you go. Just do it. Mm. But we do it without the lens of our performance measures because those projects exist to make the measure improve. We want the measure to improve because that means our goal's been achieved. We forget to do that. So step eight in PUMP is making sure we use our measures uh, as the the – overarching bit of feedback that guides whether the actions we've chosen, whether the strategic initiative or change initiative or improvement project is really doing what we hoped it would do. Hmm. And if it's not doing what we hoped it would do, the measure is basically not showing us any change at all. And we need to learn from that. Hmm. So the last step of pump is um, kind of rinse and repeat, but it's a bit of uh, learning embedded in there as well so that we don't waste precious resources Hmm. on actions that are not doing what we wanted them to do very good well that's that's very intuitive and clever isn't it that it's uh you know that's a that's a great tool um to to, to be able to guide activity and to be able to evaluate and 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 as, as as a basis of conversation for that you know, initial point that you, you made that really what it's about is continuous improvement. It's about how can we continue to get better? And the only way we can do that is if we've got very clear measures as to what we are tracking towards those goals. Yeah, that measures are so much more transformational than people realise, especially when we decouple them as, you know, you know, from performance appraisals and from measuring people. That's not where they serve us at all. In fact, they drive performance in the wrong direction. Mm. When we focus them, like you say, on continuous improvement, improving our processes, it is transformational. Mm. Uh, Time and again, people will tell me their first time through Pump, they say, oh, this is the first time I've ever felt excited about measurement. And they don't just say happy or satisfied, they say excited. Mm. And that's great. I think, you know, you also mentioned that it kind of seems really logical in hindsight. And I think I think the powerful thing when we want to do something different is to break it into little steps mm. and trust the steps, follow mm. them and just do one thing at a time and not jump ahead, which is one of the mistakes people make a lot, particularly with measurement. Let's get it over and done with. We'll just jump ahead, yep. brainstorm some measures, chuck them in a report and see what happens. And, yep. and usually only bad things happen. Yeah, yeah. Or it, well, irrelevant things really. Or there's, there's yeah. no um... – uh, no, no meat on the bones really that can lead you to have conversations that are going to be relevant and useful. I like your metaphors. Yeah, meat on the bones. Yeah. So in terms of uh, this particular methodology, it's obviously, you know, widespread, uh, yeah. you know, being used all around the world. And I'd commend yeah. people to go and have a look at the PUMP website to see the numbers of people and, and indeed the people in very influential positions who are using this methodology as a, as a way to, um, as, as a sort of underpinning to continuous improvement. So where do you see the sort of maturity of, um, of measurement? Are we still a long way away from it? And say, particularly in the government public sector, how, how, what's your observation of how well or otherwise governments are measuring their performance? I think we're still at, at fairly low levels of maturity with measurement, and, and there are a bunch of reasons for that. I, I, there's there's no one to blame for this. It's just that it has been such a hard – it's one of the hardest changes to make in an organisation because of the history of it being so threatened. People are very anxious about it, and with their misunderstandings of what it should really be about, uh, it, it it's – it scares them and and they're not going to commit to something that they feel is is going to be a tool used against them. I think that is probably the biggest thing we've got to, we've got to overcome. Um, The other challenge, especially in government, David, that makes measurement feel a little bit scary uh, to leaders in particular is this transparency accountability dynamic that's so important right now and has been for a little while. Uh, And that is, the same kind of thing that employees feel about measurement being a judgment tool is that leaders feel it as a judgment tool as well, that if they publish numbers that are telling the truth, um, everybody's going to come down on them like a a ton of bricks and and get in their way of doing what they really should be doing, which is leading the execution of strategy to make the measures look better and improve. So it's a bit of a hard dynamic there. So I reckon one of the things that government leaders really could be doing – 
is starting internally with a better measurement approach and using that approach to find the truth about how things work and, and how they don't work and internally focusing on on improvement and not worrying so much about getting those measures that are telling the truth uh, to be published yet. Mm. It, it, it's too soon for that. I think they need to get in, w- wins internally and show that they're they're really getting control of performance of the impact their their various agencies and departments are making, uh, and and then we'll get to a point where measurements mature enough where the transparency and accountability piece becomes constructive. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, I think that's that's a good insight because again, there's that mentality of. You know, the, the accountability mechanism, say, here in Canberra, you know, is, you know, Senate estimates and public servants live in fear of being, you know, dragged before Senate estimates and being chewed out for why a particular program or project may not be performing and, you know, et cetera. So it's um, hence the reluctance to actually, oh, well, maybe we won't make it too clear and too specific because then we can't be monstered um, in that sort of adversarial sort of way that, uh you know, the, the system is set up to, to be. And I just wonder whether or not this, you know, broader global context that we're now living through at the moment with COVID-19 as to whether or not we emerge onto the other side where we've got less of a blame culture and more of a collaboration learning, learning culture as to, you know, so the questions might change as a result of uh, changes in, in expectation in, in the community. I would so love that change to happen because that is the only way that we're we're really going to kind of un, unleash this potential that's been yeah. locked up uh, in that that blame culture uh, for so long. We just have so much potential to to you know improve society for everybody, you know, and to yeah. and and to and and to enjoy and love work and feel like we really are contributing to something bigger than ourselves. But while ever the blame culture is there, it, it just constrains it. I love what you said about that collaboration and learning culture. That's exactly what we need. And wouldn't it be wonderful if if the world on the other side of COVID-19 took us there? Well, people are going to have a long time to think about these things for, you know, while they're sitting at home and, and locked up. You yeah. Know. Uh, yeah, you know, reflecting on 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 a lot of things, you know, I think it's going to be a, a, a massive tipping point. And as we said just prior to coming to air, that uh, you know, who knows where, where we're going to end up at, 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 on the other side of this thing. Yes, the, yes, it will end, but what sort of a world are we going to uh, be in? And, and indeed, I think this context, and particularly in the area of communications, context is so critically important that that's where change can thrive and flourish if indeed there is some movement in, in that space. So um, we will wait and see. But Tracy, listen, uh, Stacey, I've taken up a lot of your time today um, and I'm very grateful for you to do that. And um, I'm going to try to do a, you know, a little bit more pump, you know, a little less sort of, <laughs> you know, outputs, outcomes, outtakes and, uh, and perhaps maybe uh, review the way we go about things here because I think there – I can see value um, – just in the way that we go about our work and deliver value uh, and, and put the investment and time into it because I think it can be a, a business tool really and that's really essentially what you're describing is that it's a tool yeah. to, to improve. It, it absolutely is. Mm. Okay, Stacey, thank you so much for giving us your time today. And ladies and gentlemen, Stacey, before you go, where, where can people learn more uh, about Pump and, and get access to some of the experts that you have uh, in your team all around the world, actually? And we do have a global audience for uh, for GovComs. Yeah, yeah, they are all around the world. Uh stacybar.com is my website and from there you can access pretty much everything that that um, that we offer um, my my blog and newsletter which is free and has loads of practical tips in it we do have we usually have workshops around the world teaching people pump but yeah. with our current situation we're creating a, a, um, online versions and I'm actually pretty excited about that and it comes back to what you were suggesting David that the world will be different and I think a lot of these online tools when we discover how to make them collaborative and engaging um, could actually change the way we work as well so we're doing that with pump but yeah stacybar.com is the place to go and um, people will be able to find listeners will be able to find anything they um, they need from there okay fantastic well Audience, you have been told. You you know where to go. You know where to go and find the information, and you've got to practice this. You know, and myself, I'm mm. gonna. I've got to go away. I've got to learn, and I've got to be better. 
because that's the way. Again, because this is the fundamental challenge that we have in communications is that we're not taken seriously. And this is the way that we can be taken seriously. So the pump methodology, let's all get involved, let's understand it and let's apply it and let's get better and let's create that value and impact that we know that we do in many cases, but often we turn around and go, well, actually, I don't know how, you know, yeah, it's sort of working, but I really don't have any uh, proof um, to be able to uh, validate the decisions that I've made in a tactical and strategic sense. So anyway, enough of that. Thank you so much for coming along today to have another listen. I will be back at the same time in a couple of weeks, but for the moment, it's bye for now. You've been listening to the GovComs podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, be sure to rate and subscribe to stay up to date with our latest episodes.